Welcome to another edition of Dr. Twyman's Ask Me Anything. Tonight I can try a little new microphone. Uh, I got a new adapter. This is my fancy podcast microphone. So hopefully the audio is better. So for those that log on, let me know if this is sounding better for you. But uh, gonna kind of tease you a little bit with the uh, uh, the vascular health solutions kit that I'm putting together. So I spent some time this weekend uh, looking at some different uh, at home devices and uh, testing. Uh, gear that you can use to kind of look at how healthy your arteries are at home. So thank you for those that uh, said yes. Um, so I'm in the process of putting together an Amazon store where you can potentially order some of this. I also probably have some of the kits available at my office in St. Louis at Apollo Cardiology and putting together kind of like a swag bag that all the gear would fit in it. This would be your heart attack proof uh, prevention kit essentially. You know, we'll have nitric oxide test strips in there to see how well your body's ability to make nitric oxide through your salivary pathway. You know, probably would recommend you an Omron involved blood pressure cuff. You know, still playing around with the, uh, the BP doctor uh, watch that does photoplasmography as well as a uh, air bladder that looks at your radial pulse. Um, and then there's a couple other devices that look at pulse wave velocity. So putting together kind of a heart attack prevention kit for home use, you know, it's a good starting point for people to kind of monitor their values in between office visits. Um, you know, we obviously have more fancy devices at Apollo Cardiology, you know, including the carotid entomomedial thickness scans, the endopat scans that look at nitric oxide availability, the max pulse, which looks at pulse wave velocity. We have a uh, AAA ultrasound, which looks for you know aneurysms in your aorta, and then also have a, a smart ABI that looks at how well the blood flow is going down to your legs. So those are kind of like the head to toe screening that we do in the office. But there's a lot of great uh, home screening devices that I've uh, played around with, and uh, you know you see me you know I'm showing you the BioStrap before and some of the other devices. So. I'm still working on it. Again, it'll probably be on uh, an Amazon store I'm putting together. I just literally got approved for this Amazon store yesterday. And then also uh, try to get some of the uh, kits ordered in. So be on the lookout. I'll uh, keep announcing in my story when they're more ready to go. So thank you for all that joining tonight. Uh, trying something a little bit different. Using my usual podcast microphone. I had to get a special adapter to be able to plug it into my iPhone. Uh, but I can't use my usual stand, so you know, sorry if there's a little bit of bobbling. I'll have to get a new uh, kind of a iPhone stand to be able to use this thing. So tonight, yeah, we'll answer the uh, the questions. Uh, there's a few good ones. Uh, if you have any others, uh, just drop them in the comments, and we'll get started here. All right. So first question up tonight. Who would best benefit from nitric oxide supplementation? Sterile producers or absorbers? Uh, it's a trick question. Uh, neither, because the answer is actually both. Everybody could likely benefit from nitric oxide supplementation. Test don't guess. So look at your nitric oxide pathways. You can get oral test strips. You can look at pulse wave velocity. You can look at blood pressure. If you have access to an Indipat scan like you do at my office at Apollo Cardiology, you'll know exactly how much nitric oxide your arteries can release when there's a vascular stressor. Um, but people who are either hyperproducers or hyperabsorbers of sterols, the more ApoB particles that you have, the more risk that there's oxidized phospholipid ApoB particles, and that oxidized sterols actually damages the glycocalyx, leading to lower nitric oxide availability. So in English, the lipoproteins are like tennis balls crashing into the arterial wall. The more that there are, the more likely it damages the artery wall and then lower nitric oxide availability. So probably both would likely benefit. Next question up tonight. Can you decrease plaque in the arteries and how? Yes, absolutely, you can decrease plaque in the arteries. Um, not common that the hard plaque would regress, but the salt plaque potentially does. You know, you can see that you have salt plaque on either a carotid intermedial thickness scan or a clearly CT coronary angiogram. Both will be able to demonstrate if you have salt plaque. And yes, you can get that salt plaque to delipidate and shrink down. Um, how to do that? Well, we have to support the endothelium and the glycocalyx. There's various supplements and medications that can help do that. You have to look for all sources of oxidative stress and inflammation and cool that down. And then you have to optimize the lipoproteins. Likely should be less than the fifth percentile. So an A will be less than 55 in those instances if you really want to see plaque decreasing. And you can use multiple tools to do that. So the next question up tonight, 
is it okay to resume TRT post heart attack? The person has a stent in the right coronary. So I can't answer this question directly because I don't know how long ago your heart attack was and I can't provide one-on-one -on -one medical device in this situation. But this is one of the cases where you know, it is possible, but you have to talk to the doctors who prescribe the testosterone and you have to talk to your cardiologist. There's unfortunately still a black box warning on testosterone and cardiovascular risk. So is it possible? Yes, but it's going to depend on how recent the heart attack is and what your cardiologist and the doctor prescribing the testosterone says. What are the best things someone can do to daily to stay healthy and prevent heart issues? Great question, um, because it is a daily type of battle. You know, it's win the day. So I frequently talk about kind of the four pillars of optimizing your health. Obviously, that's going to include nutrition, exercise, stress management, and sleep. Sleep is probably the biggest one that people kind of fall short on often. So optimizing your sleep. Getting seven and a half to eight hours of restorative sleep every night is key. Do you have to track your sleep? Not necessarily, but if you wake up full of energy, your brain's working the way you want, and you don't feel like you had to like take naps in the afternoon, you're probably sleeping well enough. But if you're not optimized on your sleep, then you know usually I like the BioStrap personally for sleep tracking, um, but the Wear Ring works well, the Whoop Band also works pretty well for that. But otherwise, it's mostly focusing on getting your circadian rhythms in check if they're not. So this is where, you know, never missing a sunrise for all the days that you got is key. That morning light sets your circadian rhythm every day by programming your supercosmic nucleus and then mitigating your artificial light at night so that your body knows that it's nighttime and you can go to sleep. Thus, the blue black and glasses is if you're going to be in front of these backlit screens or need lights on so people can actually see you. So work on your circadian rhythms and sleep first, and then you can start working on the other levers as well. Question about thoughts on an elevated troponin on recent lab results. Can exercise affect troponin? So it can depend a little bit on if this lab work was done on an outpatient basis or if you're seeing that in urgent care or ER. You know, there are some high sensitivity uh, troponin assays that are done uh, with some of the uh, advanced cardiovascular lab companies. Um, there's always going to be some level of troponin. It's just what is the cutoff to indicate that there's an actual more rapid turnover of myocardial cells. You know, if a heart cell is um, infarcted, you know, it will die and it's going to release troponin into the bloodstream. Think of like a balloon popping and all the contents spill out into the bloodstream. So the higher the troponin levels, the more cardiac damage is being accrued. Um, you know, lack of blood flow is the number one cause, but that can be a supply demand mismatch if you're anemic. Um, you know, there's infections. There's many things that can increase the troponin. But if you're asymptomatic, it's probably less of a concern. But you may need an echocardiogram. You know, you need to know if you have plaque in your coronary arteries. You know, potentially a calcium score or you know, a CT angiogram would you know indicate is that more of a concern. Um, and definitely, exercise can increase it. So there's definitely uh, case reports. You know, like altered distance marathoners and uh, kind of Ironmen. You know, they check troponin levels after the uh, the exercise is done, and there's significantly increased levels of troponin, uh, indicating myocardial damage. Now, is it necessarily a heart attack? No. But it's definitely a lot of uh, inflammation and, uh, and, I mean, it's kind of low-level cardiac damage, but not in the classic sense where it's a occlusion in the coronary arteries causing a heart attack. So if there's elevated troponins, you know, NT, probe, P, glycan-3, then, you know, there's some stress definitely on the heart. You need to get it checked out with the people who are ordering the labs for you. Somebody is asking, can I recommend a integrative doctor in Bangalore, India? Unfortunately, no. I've uh, actually not been to India yet. Uh, it's definitely on the bucket list, but I don't know any um, integrative cardiologist in that uh, part of the world. And isn't a heart attack slash stroke really a process? What signs can one notice a few months ahead? Um, Yes, definitely it is a process, but often people's first sign is that they're having the event. They're having a heart attack or stroke. Um, you know, atherosclerosis actually starts in utero. This is one of my mentors, Dr. Mark Houston, talked about last week on a webinar that I was um, speaking on with him. Um, and, you know, it's something that 
takes many years to develop. But typically patients don't have symptoms um, until they have the plaque rupture. And that's how most heart attacks and strokes occur. Now there are embolic events where blood clots can uh, kind of get lodged in an artery, but most plaques are a plaque rupture. Um, and you know, unless you have a 70-80% blockage in one of the coronary arteries, you're not going to have symptoms even when you exercise. You're not going to have shortness of breath or pain, pressure in your chest, or exercise intolerance. You know, more than half the heart attacks that occur you know, happen with plaques that are less than 50%. So you don't feel those plaques until they rupture. So sometimes people will have some signs that if they go back and look at it that they're starting to develop exercise intolerance, shortness of breath. They may get a discomfort in their chest. It's not always described as pain. It may just be an uncomfortable sensation. It may be pressure. It may feel like a kind of tugging sensation that goes up to the neck, the back, or the shoulders. But typically, those symptoms are going to be brought on by exercise or emotional stress. And then after you know you stop the exercise or the stressor goes away, the symptoms improve. So it's one of those cases where you know you have to know what the underlying arteries are doing. So this is why the calcium score test is such a great starting point for people. Not a perfect test, but if your score is zero, you generally are going to fall in that low risk category. If your score is over zero, you need to figure out why you're starting to develop plaque in your arteries. All right. So great questions tonight that were pre-submitted. Did see a few comments popping up, and so I'll uh, hit those ones as well. And while I'm going through here, uh, just give me a few thumbs up if you like the audio. I'm playing around with my uh, usual podcast microphone. Had to get a special adapter for my phone to, to get it to work. But because of that, I can't use my usual stand, so I have to kind of handhold this, and that's why it's bouncing around a little bit tonight. But give me some thumbs up if you can hear this better than normal. So. Um, somebody's got to send me a little bit more context on this. Thoughts on the Solex 660, have you used or recommended? I would suspect that some type of photo by modulation device by the 660, 660 nanometers is a common red spectrum uh, wavelength of photo by modulation therapy. Um, if it's a device, I have not particularly used that particular one. Um, that's a good wavelength, but you would need to know the irradiance are also known as the power density of the device, and that can help you kind of determine what um, dosage you could you get out of this type of device. And that would then tell you how long to use the device for. Um, patient's asking, or person's asking, for a 70-year-old man who's already on a sten, is it necessary to do a CAC, or calcium score testing? Um, not necessarily necessary, but the calcium score testing can still risk stratify you. Um, you now, it is true that once your score is over zero, there's really no indication to repeat the scan for most people. And statins, if you've been on for long periods of time, often are going to cause plaques that used to be soft plaque and potentially more vulnerable. It'll cause those plaques to calcify. So it is not common. If, not it is not uncommon if somebody's been on a stand for many years that they're going to have a positive calcium score test. But it still depends on how high at risk it is. You know, if your calcium score is over 400, that's high risk. If your score is over 1,000, that's very high risk. You know, there's a great chance that one of your three coronary arteries is going to have a severe stenosis in them. And I've seen patients you know, under the age of 40 have scores over 1,300. I've seen a couple in the 3,000 range. And for uh, reference, the highest score I've seen is greater than 7,000. So it is still worth it at times to uh, get the scan. You know, the only time you shouldn't get a scan is if you've had a previous event. If you've already had a heart attack, stroke, if you have a stent or have had bypass surgery, the calcium score test is not going to add any more risk stratification to you. You're already considered high risk and treated as such. Does one need any eye protection while using red light therapy? Um, it's going to completely depend on the device. Now, there are some protocols that can help with um, vision issues, but typically the, the duration of treatment is going to be under three minutes long. You know, if you have a very uh, high radiance device, it may be uncomfortable for the light to be that bright in your face. So, you know, you may want to wear glasses in that case. Often, if you just keep your eyelids closed, you know, it's not going to cause uh, any damage to your eyes for the most part. Um, 
you know, that's just my personal experience, but you need to know what you're treating. So you need to know how long to use the device for, how far away from the device. So this is a medical device that it's all comers can do it, but often you do not necessarily need to use eye protection with those, you know, unless you're just directly blasting on your face, um, then you may want to use it. Somebody's asking about how they can get more deep sleep. They seem to get REM sleep, but not much deep sleep. Um, you know, stop eating four hours before bed, no alcohol at all. Caffeine, depends if you're a fast or slow metabolizer of caffeine. If you're a slow metabolizer, no caffeine or very minimal and stop before 9 a.m. Um, exercise should be at least two, three hours before bedtime. You don't want to be having a hot body temperature going to bed. You know, if you're doing any type of cold exposure therapy, cold showers, cold plunges, you typically want to do that, you know, within about an hour before bed so that you're cool and then cooling down and then you warm up right before you get into bed. Um, and there are various supplements that sometimes can help with it, but we need to know more medical background before you know, recommending anything that uh, is exogenous. But always start with uh, the low hanging fruit, optimizing circadian rhythms, you know, the zeitgebers, light and food. Those are the big ones to focus on first. What is microvascular disease? Great question. So microvascular disease is the smaller blood vessels. Um, you know, 99% of your blood vessels are microscopic. You know, there's reports that, you know, take a human hair diameter, you could probably put 100 of these microvessels inside that one human hair. So most of your blood to your tissues and organs is delivered to this microcirculation. And if it's, you know, it's basically some of those blood vessels are so small that the red blood cells have to go through them one by one. The blood vessels are smaller than the red blood cells and the red blood cells have to squeeze to get down through them. And so often endothelial dysfunction starts in more of the, the micro vessels. So same story applies. You want to, you know, support nitric oxide. If it's low, you may consider a glycocalyx promoter, lower oxidative stress and inflammation and then modulate lipoproteins as needed. Good, so somebody says they can hear well, so good that the microphone's working well. I got some other ones on order that are a little bit more portable, but this one I'll just play around with a little bit and see if it works for you guys. Can soluble fiber lower cholesterol? A little bit, not very much. I think uh, I've seen you know maybe up to 5% from where it's at. So I think it's more useful for, you know, bowel regularity than really thinking about it to lower cholesterol. You know, if you really need to lower cholesterol that's in the gut, really only azetamide is going to work for that. Somebody's asking, how do I like my sauna? Um, so I've had two saunas at home. I've had a um, Sunlight and Impulse three-person sauna at my old place. Love that sauna. Used it almost every day in the winter when I had it. Moved, gave it to a family member. So still technically in my uh, uh, family, so maybe I'll get it back someday. Um, but uh, when I moved, the new place didn't have a space that I could put that big of a sauna. So I'll totally get it a uh, one-person relax sauna. The relax sauna kind of looks like a um, hot potato box. And so you know you sit in a chair and your head pops out of it. Uh, and, you know, it has a uh, heater that, you know, your feet rest above, um, and it gets pretty warm. So I've only used it once or twice, um, just more out of, uh, you know, stacking the hacks, you know, just trying to focus more on the exercise right now and didn't really kind of build in uh, time to do too much sauna. But sauna is outstanding if you have high blood pressure, exposure to heavy metals, you know, helps with relaxation. So saunas are outstanding if you have access to it, you know. Generally, you should use it three to four times a week if you have access and are trying to treat something medically. Or if you want to just improve your redox potential and structure the water in your cells, use the sauna more routinely. Is microvascular disease reversible? Yes. You just have to figure out what's causing the dysfunction and improve it. And you know, we see that often in the practice. Um, so got to figure out what's causing the uh, endothelial dysfunction. You know, it's often oxidative stress, inflammation, dyslipidemia, heavy metals, infections, and then fix those causes, and the microvascular disease can improve. 
do low carb diets raise LDL? Is saturated fat restriction beneficial? Um, this is one of those questions where it depends on the person who's sitting in front of you. So do low carb diets cause LDL to increase? Not generally, but if somebody switches to a keto diet and they're an APOE4 carrier and the hyperabsorber of sterols and multiple multitude of other issues, then yes, in some instances, saturated fat can then start increasing their APOB containing particles. Mostly does it by increasing cholesterol production in the liver and then also down regulating the LDL receptors. So on that side of your liver, you have these LDL receptors. They're like cargo docking stations for these LDL particles. If you don't have enough docking stations, the LDL particles just keep zipping by through the arteries trying to find an off ramp to get out. And those individuals, if they cut their saturated fat down to 8% or less, you will frequently see their lipoprotein you know, uh, fractions improving. So this is one of those cases where, you know, test don't guess, or, you know, I'm starting to use the, the analogy I'm from Missouri. You got to show me, show me your lab before you did the dietary intervention and show me what the labs look like after it. And then we can figure out what nutrition strategies you can do to affect it. But often, you know, if you had to quote normal lipids and then you change your diet and your lipids got significantly worse, then just go back to what you used to be doing or go back to a Mediterranean template. Unless you want to really end up on medications to lower the lipoproteins, which not everybody wants to do. All right. So I see somebody joined. I think Morty joined. I think Morty has a question about duck. Duck is a great source of uh, protein. Yes. Um, what strength of red lights are needed for optimal effects? Um, it's you're looking for the milliwatts per centimeter squared. That again is the irradiance or the power density of the device. It does not need to be 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared to get optimal effects. Generally, the full body treatments are between 12 and 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Um, Gimba Red, Andrew, the owner, he has some great blogs on his website that kind of goes through a lot of the dosing protocols for it and that you do not need high irradiance to get all the effects. So go look at uh, Gimba Red's website. Uh, somebody saying that they're going to be getting the Boston Heart Lab panel soon. What are the top three or four numbers uh, or indicators that you should focus on first? So congratulations on going to give you that test. That is one of the gold standard tests that I do at my office uh, at Apollo Cardiology to you know, help patients uh, optimize their cardiovascular risk factors. Um, you know, Three or four numbers, it's going to depend if they check a panel that's similar to mine, but apolipoprotein B, that generally should be less than 70 in most people that have any vascular disease. LPLA, if it hasn't been checked before, is LPLA elevated? It should have the uh, cholesterol balance test, which will tell you if you're a hyperabsorber or a hyperproducer of sterols. That gives you an idea of what are better treatment options, either dietary interventions, or supplements, or medications. Um, and then potentially the uh, the fatty acid balance gives you a little bit of idea of how well you're absorbing the different fats that you're currently eating. So. Are you having issues hyperabsorbing saturated fat? Trans fats, you should not have high levels of trans fats. If you do, you got to figure out where you're getting those from. Those things really cause the cells to get inflamed and the cells to get stiff. It'll look at your omega-3 fatty acids, and then we'll also look at a little bit at your monounsaturated fats. So those are probably the top four things I would look at. So... Question about you know, how to lower high sensitivity CRP, the exercise and our fit. So it depends on how high the CRP is and if the other inflammatory markers are also increased. You know, if LPPLA2 and myeloproxase are elevated, then you have a lot of vascular inflammation. Then you got to figure out what's causing the vascular inflammation. CRP is specific that, I should say it's sensitive, it's high you know, if the immune system's turned on, but it doesn't tell you exactly what's causing it to be elevated. You know? Often it's you know something that you know person is um, you know sensitive from foodstuffs. You know it can be due to high oxidative stress. It can be due to heavy metals. It can be due to sleep apnea. It can be due to a recent viral infection. It can be due to an autoimmune condition. Um, there are hundreds of reasons why CRP can be elevated, and you just have to start looking at the labs to figure it out. You know are they insulin resistant? Um, do they not eat fish at all and they have an imbalanced omega six and omega three ratio? Do they have a lot of trans fats? There's a lot of things you can look at on the Boston Heart Lab panel or a Cleveland Heart Lab panel that can clue into why the high sensitivity CRP would be elevated. Uh, 
All right. And so somebody is asking a question about uh, healthy ranges of heart rates. Um, theirs is on the higher end, 68 beats per minute. Would moving to sea level be advised? Um, it doesn't uh, really um, flow exactly, but I'll just kind of say in generalities, I mean, resting heart rates you know, in a bell-shaped curve mostly are going to fall between 60 and 100. Probably 95% of people have a heart rate between 60 and 100. But that is the bell-shaped curve. You know, there's probably 2.5% of people who have scores under 60. That's still considered normal. And there's 2.5% of people who have scores over 100 that are still considered normal. They don't necessarily have inappropriate sinus tachycardia. So if you're generally physically fit, and by physically fit, you know, you're working out 150 minutes a week, you know, you should generally have resting heart rates in the 60s. You know, if you're very fit, you probably have resting heart rates in the 50s. Um, so a heart rate of 68 would not make me concerned. You know, you know, it's, you know, one of the things where, like, it depends on, like, where you started. If you said your resting heart rate was normally 45 and it's 68, okay, well, are you anemic or do you have an infection? You know, heart rate is just a sign that something is stressing the body when it's increased. So try to figure out what that stressor is. Now, moving to sea level, would it improve? Unknown. You know, it depends on, you know, uh, multiple factors, but you know, if you were saying that you had high altitude um, altitude sickness, then yes, decreasing altitude would improve heart rate. And then, um, sorry for somebody said that. How do you find out? I don't remember what your original question was, but if you could put that back in the comments, I'll try to answer. How do you find out? Okay, so I can't answer this question directly what to do, but I'll say it in generalities. Somebody's talking about, you know, taking a medication as azetamide and also a statin. They started having some muscle symptoms, so they stopped them. Um, you know, can they change the dose? You're going to have to talk to the person who prescribed the medications if you can do that or not. But that is the number one side effect of the statins and also azetamide is muscle symptoms. So muscle pain, weakness, and in extremely rare cases, rhabdomyolysis, which in my 20 plus years as being a physician, I've never seen a case of rhabdomyolysis from lipid lowering therapy. When I was a doctor for the, the Navy and was taking care of the Marine recruits at Paris Island, I saw many, many cases of rhabdomyolysis after the DIs uh, uh, PT these kids in the summer uh, in South Carolina. I saw a lot of rhabdomyolysis. I've never seen one from the medications. Um, but that being said, you know, in all comers, people who tend to have more muscle symptoms tend to be ApoE4 carriers. They have hypothyroidism, they have low vitamin D levels, they have low CoQ10 levels. And in some instances, if you do the right genetics for people, you can look for a gene called SLCO1B1. If they have an abnormal variant of that gene, three to four times more risk that they're going to have muscle symptoms, especially with the fat-soluble vitamins, fat-soluble statins like atorvastatin. So if you can't tolerate atorvastatin, you might be able to tolerate rosuvastatin or pravastatin at lower doses. Um, and, you know, there are other kind of mitigation strategies that can also potentially work for it. But I can't tell you what you can do. You have to talk to the, the doctors that prescribed them, and they'll figure out what cocktail that you might be able to improve on. But I would say, you know, look at CoQ10 levels, vitamin D, APOE genotype, SLCO1B genotype, um, and your thyroid levels. And that can give you the kind of the idea, like, are you a good candidate to re-challenge with different statins? And if you can tolerate statins after, you know, doing another trial um, of a different class of statins, you know, then they consider things like pentadoic acid, which is known as Nexitol. You consider PCSK9 inhibitors. Most of the time that's for path or paleoment, but there's also a twice a year illicitly option for people. Somebody's saying, why do their heart rate go up and down dramatically when they're sitting down? That would be an unknown unknown at this time. You know, you would need a heart monitor to confirm that that's truly uh, happening um, and that you're not having inappropriate sinus tachycardia or POTS, which is postural orthotic tachycardia syndrome, um, you know, autonomic dysfunction. You know, that's probably the, the starting points I would start looking at, but a heart rate monitor, potentially an echocardiogram, some labs that can generally get to the root cause of what's causing the heart rates to, to change.
Somebody's talking about that their total and their LDL cholesterol went down due to garlic cloves and lemon consumption with a reduction in carb consumption. Um, don't know too much of the garlic or the lemon had much of an effect on that. But again, don't make too many you know lifestyle plans based off a total or an LDL cholesterol. They're just not that predictive. Now, those are the passengers inside the lipoproteins. So you have to actually measure the lipoproteins. So you need to look at what happens with the LDL particle numbers, or better yet, the apolipoprotein B, because ApoB encompasses the LDL particles, the VLDLs, the ILDLs, and the LPLA particles. So how do you find out what's causing microvascular disease? You got to do the right test to figure out how bad the microvascular disease is and then do uh, blood work. You know, often it's insulin resistance, so high insulin, high glucose. It can be due to high uric acid, high homocysteine. Um, it can be due to heavy metals. Um, it can be due to excessive sodium intake. There's many, many causes. You know, the arteries have 60,000 miles of coating called an endothelium and a glycocalyx. If that coating gets damaged, then you start developing the microvascular disease. Somebody's asking, do I like the mobile EKG machine app? Um, if you're speaking of the Cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A, yes, I've had it since it was originally out called the Alive Corp. It's outstanding, particularly I like the six lead EKG. Um, it helps patients kind of take control of their uh, heart rate situations at home. If they're having palpitations, they can record a 30-second rhythm strip, and then they can message me. I actually was helping a, a person out this weekend, and you know that cardio device helped really kind of narrow down what was going on. So, yes, I do like that cardio device for that. So somebody's saying that you know somebody's mother has congestive heart failure. She's allowed two grams of sodium and up to 64 ounces of fluid. Isn't that too much? Um, it really depends. I mean, sodium, you know, guidelines are generally probably too low for most people. You know, typically three to four grams is probably more typical for many, but some people are more sensitive. You know, it's the glycocalyx that buffers most of that sodium. So if you have a really poor glycocalyx function, less sodium is gonna be uh, allowed before you start having more fluid retention. Um, so the 64 ounce of fluid, you know, that depends. You know, so you know, the person's having significant dyspnea, they're having um, orthopnea, they're having fluid retention in their abdomen, you know, fluid retention in their legs, then yes, yeah, too much. Uh, somebody's asking, is it okay to replace seed oils with real butter? I would say in most cases, but again, test don't guess. You know, you're not supposed to eat huge quantities of seed oils. Okay, so I think I got through all the questions tonight. I appreciate them. There were some great ones. Like I said, I've been playing around with this uh, new adapter so I could plug in my podcast microphone. So hopefully the audio is a little bit better for most people tonight. Uh, I will transfer this uh, video up to my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to start working on some longer form videos there as well. I'm probably going to do like a breakdown of my most recent lab report so that patients can learn how to read their own labs a little bit better. And I'll use mine as the example. So for those that are joining a little bit later, um, I was talking about it earlier that you know, I am putting together kind of like a home testing kit, you know, throwing together something that has all my kind of like favorite toys to screen your arteries at home. Um, I'll probably have that done in the next week or two. I'll probably have a starting point on an Amazon store. And then if you're a patient of mine and in St. Louis, I'll have certain kits that I'll put together and put them in little bags. You know, I'll have nitric oxide testing strips. It'll have blood pressure cuffs. It'll have things that can look at pulse wave velocity of your arteries and tell you, you know, what is your arterial age? So people can get an idea if, you know, if they're really in the low risk bucket and keep doing what they're doing, or if they're in the high risk bucket and they need to work with their local doctors, or if they need to reach out to us, then go to my website, drtime.com, and they can apply to work with us. We're still at this moment, you know, still accepting new patients, but it's getting tighter and tighter to get in to see us. You know, it's, you know, I think our next available appointment is near the end of April. So if you're interested in working with us, don't wait too long on that. So appreciate your guys' time and attention. I'll see you guys next Monday, 6 p.m. Central Time.